a little. Wait, do you want to stand up in front, Mark, or do you want to have a seat? I don't mind, whichever. I'm very happy to. I'll stand a little bit with here. intent over here. How about okay, that? Perfect. <laughs> Something like intent, anyway. Fine. Well, I can. I might, I might even sit. That's a oh. nice thing to see. Oh, I'm next to a microphone now. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you all very much for coming to this talk tonight. Um, this is Daleswood Health. Um, we are a private GP and health practice um, set up by my wife and myself uh, about 18 months ago, just over, and we've been in this building for uh, just over a year now. Um, and what we want to do is host a series of talks um, to inform anyone that wants to know a little bit more about conditions that they've got already or that they're worried about. Um, it's free. Um, we really believe in, in empowering and informing patients, um, and that's something on the NHS that we've really, I've really struggled to do for the last 10 years as a GP. So this is a turning point for us, and it's really to try and get um, our patients, you, you don't have to be our patients, to become uh, an expert patient. Um, and really that's where you might actually know more about your condition than your GP. Um, and actually, that's a good thing. Um, as a GP, I'm really meant to know a little about a lot. Um, but we have the fortune of Dr. Mark Cox, who's joined us um, tonight, who knows a lot about very specific things. Um, Not a lot about very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so um, we've been very fortunate to have a collaboration with Spire Parkway um, to get consultants in, which is actually a really valuable opportunity for, for anyone that, that wants to know a lot more or, or get familiar with either a GP or a consultant specialist that perhaps have always been a little bit intimidated. You go into a, a consultation room with, with a GP or a specialist and there are a million things going through in your head and you always forget to ask the one really important question. Well, this is an opportunity for, for you to do that. Um, and to also break down some barriers. You know, we, we're normal people. Um, we're not intimidating. We, we try to be as friendly and accommodating as, as we can. And our, our sole aim is to try and help you get the most out of your health. So that's what we are trying to uh, do with this series of talks. And we try and host one a month. Um, and we try and keep the topics um, varied uh, and what we think is important but if any of you have got suggestions or any of our patients have got suggestions we'll always happily host a talk about that. So uh, I've already alluded to to Dr Mark Cox um, he's a consultant gastroenterologist works at Spire Parkway but has NHS practice over at Walsall and um, as a specialist uh, he's got an incredible experience with endoscopy that's the camera test um, slightly unpleasant for, for most that have endured it, but he's, he's incredibly skilled at that. Um, and has a specialist interest in celiac disease, complex inflammatory bowel disease, and we'll talk about what that is, um, and the nutritional aspects of, of all of those, because they actually have a significant impact on, on nutrition. Um, today's talk's a little bit different to ones we've done previously. I tend to go on and on and on and present lots of slides and lots of um, uh, visual information, but tonight we're lucky enough to have Solihull Radio here, um, who I believe are live broadcasting this, this event, um, and so I wanted it to be much more interactive. So there's actually very few slides. This is, is really the only one with any information on, and it's uh, a picture of our anatomy. Um, a schematic on the right showing, fairly obviously, someone's head, and the journey that our gastrointestinal tract takes from mouth to bottom. Um, on the left hand side there's an image of really how that all concertinas into where it is on our body. Um, some people um, I'm sure will have googled their different parts of anatomy and tried to work out things um, but this kind of shows you roughly the different areas and I thought tonight's talk we could pretty much take a, an anatomical journey from from top to bottom um, uh, and if any of you have got any questions or anything that you really wanted to know about any individual part, then definitely direct them to Dr. Cox. Um, but if, um, if there's general things, then I'll chip in and, and try and, and give a GP's perspective. 
because ultimately my role is to look after your entire health. That's um, the psychological, that's the day-to-day -day management of your condition, and usually your GP is the first point of contact. So if you were my patient with a specific condition, I would certainly want to, to know as much as I possibly could about that. And I challenge you to a bit of a race as to who is going to be the expert. Um, and, and I really encourage my patients to, to know more than me um, because that pushes me to know even more uh, and to really become an expert in, in them and their health conditions and how it affects them. Uh, so that is the GI tract. And just talking you through, um, I don't know if everyone knows their anatomy, but um, we, we start off uh, obviously at the mouth. That's where most of our um, mechanical digestion occurs. Um, we break down food, we chew it, we... Um, we smash it up into little bits, um, and then it travels down our esophagus. That's where you used to do the, the uh, experiment in biology at school where the teacher would give you something to eat and try and get you to stand on your hand, and you discovered that peristalsis occurs because that food ends up going up rather than falling with gravity when you're, when you're on your hands. So your esophagus um, carries the food down to your stomach uh, through your chest, uh, and your stomach is sort of that little uh, bag. It looks a bit like a, um, a, a bagpipe um, from, from a, a, a sort of Scottish uh, image that you might have. Um, and that's the second element of mechanical digestion. So that's your stomach really just pulverizes your food to bits and mixes it and churns it to, uh, together. Once it's done that enough, um, it will release it into your duodenum. Now that's um, that, that sort of first L-shaped part after the, the stomach. It's not quite L-shaped. It's more sort of C or G-shaped. Um, uh, in reality, you can't see it on the left-hand diagram because all the other bits of bowel are in front of it. And that's really where the magic of digestion starts because um, you get lots more digestive enzymes being released into your bowel um, from uh, two main organs there, your pancreas um, and your, your liver. Uh, and then it takes a long journey through your small bowel. Uh, that's where most of your, well, in fact, all of your um, nutritional absorption occurs. Uh, it's then secreted at the end of your small bowel um, into your cecum. That's the first part of your large bowel. That's the part of your bowel where your appendix lives. So we all know, uh, well, we might not all know, but... Um, when you have an appendicitis, you worry about pain in the bottom right-hand corner of your tummy. Well, that's where your cecum is. Um, the next bit is the bit where we reabsorb fluids because we've got this lovely concoction or cocktail of, of digestive enzymes and waste food products. Uh, and we start to dehydrate that liquid uh, and make a stool um, or a poo. Um, and the large bowel does that pretty well. Um, it has other functions as well, but that's primarily what, what we do. And then eventually it gets to the tail end and once a day or maybe more or maybe less, um, we trot off to the loo and empty what our body doesn't want anymore. Um, it's a pretty long journey and there are lots of things that can go wrong along that journey. Uh, right the way from our swallow at the top and what happens when that food starts to travel down our esophagus to our evacuation and emptying our bowels, um, uh, going to the loo. Uh, and really tonight's talk is, is so broad that we, we put a bracket after the bowel problems and put IBS there because that's probably what most people will experience at some point in their life. Um, and that was more as a, a focus. But if we move on to the, the kind of hot topics that I thought we might want to talk about and you might have questions to ask us, um, IBS I put there at the top. Um, food intolerance and food allergy I think is definitely a hot topic. We get lots of um, patients worrying whether they're intolerant or whether they're allergic to something. And that has definitely fed into some interesting dietary trends that are occurring at the moment, in particular... Um, the, the trend to eat gluten-free um, uh, foods without a specific diagnosis of celiac disease. And we'll talk about what that is as well. And, of course, no discussion is really 
um, complete without talking about cancers, because that's what we might all worry about at, at some point. And bowel cancer is certainly very high up on, on the list of, of causes of death, but also of morbidity, and by that we mean illness. So you can survive it, but um, you, you are quite likely to, to get it. And, and several of us in this room will almost certainly develop a bowel cancer at some point in our lives. Um, so we were going to talk just briefly about the things that you as patients should be aware of, things that when you say it to a GP, my ears immediately prick up and I'm there going, I don't need to know anymore, you're going off to see someone like Dr. Cox. Um, and with that, I think we will open it up to the floor and ask if anyone's got any questions um, or anything that they want to ask straight away. There's a hand up immediately, brilliant. Absolutely, and, and that's, yeah, well this is just a, a starter for 10, um, it, it's really your night, and I'll, I'll leave Mark to... Do you want to just go back to, to, yep. to, to the, the, the sort of the anatomy slide, because that sort of makes sense to me, <laughs> a little bit, or well, allegedly I know my way around it anyway. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, and nobody actually knows what normal is, that's the really scary bit. Am I um, too loud, too... Too noisy, whatever. Um, and that is where there is a problem, because there is no such thing as normal. All right? And that is a real, real issue when you're a doctor, because somebody says, well, I go to the toilet five times a day, and the person before them has been going five times a day for 30 years, and they're perfectly happy going to the toilet five times a day. And you've only been going to the toilet once a week until three weeks ago when you're going five times a day. Um, the answer is help. That changes everything so that is actually really quite important and one of the most important things that we are interested in and I suppose the bit and we'll come back to answer your question hopefully in the end and if I don't please shout um, we are not in control of what goes on we can swallow pretty much at will unless you've got nasty neurological conditions that impairs your swallow but 99.9% .9 of the population can control their swallow and go, Bloom! and it's into the esophagus. That's great. From that point onwards, you don't say down a bit, left a bit, up a bit, stay there for a bit, and all those things. It does it automatically. And the, you know, I say automatically, it is important to say that because it's controlled by what's called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is, if I gave, drove you five miles down the road to the NEC tonight, and unfortunately Gary Barlow can't sing and I throw you a microphone, most of you would have butterflies run to the toilet and scream and have the jeeming abdabs. Um, that, I think, is normal, but that's an autonomic response. All right? But the autonomic response of the butterflies is all your gut working over time. All right? So if your gut is being driven by autonomic stimulation, it will change how it works and therefore it might go wrong. So the important bit, as Ollie said, is that it goes down the esophagus, hopefully in a nice coordinated way, gets to the bottom end, which is roughly closed. It's a bloody awful design really, but never mind, it's pretty much closed. This bit squeezes, this bit opens, it goes into your stomach, it closes again, and the next bit might do the same. The reason it closes is, this, as Ollie said, insinuated is that the stomach has two really important roles. One is that it churns everything around and macerates it up a bit, makes it all a bit smaller than it was. But it also produces a lot of acid, which helps with the initial breakdown of the product of food. All right? That bit takes however long it takes. But you don't say, well, it's been in my stomach for 17 and a half minutes now, because that's the national average. I want it to move forward now. It does that automatically. And that may take an hour. It may take five minutes, but that's the deal. It then goes through the small intestine um, and the other bits aid digestion. This, all the small bowel does is allow a surface area for the digestive enzymes to break things down into small enough bits that allow it to go across into the, into the bloodstream. I'm going to wager none of you other than Ollie, how much fluid per day do you think arrives there? Four. 
Four litres, probably. Um, if you have four litres coming out of your bottom every day, I'd be quite worried about you, and I'm sure you'd be very worried about yourselves. Um, so it, the body is really, really good at sucking water out of that situation. All right? And that, again... Is under the this colon is under control of the autonomic nervous system. We all know that sometimes when you're very stressed or somebody's done something really nasty to you or you've just been run over by a bus, you probably empty your bowels. That's a normal stress response. Those kind of things have an impact on how your colon works and moves things along. As I say, we don't know what normal is. So that's really important to understand that. The issue about drugs and absorption, it is actually really quite unusual to malabsorb drugs, all right? There are some really interesting things about drugs because some of them interact with each other and some of them, if you reduce the amount of acid you produce, sometimes you deactivate a drug or you activate a drug more so sooner than you wanted to and therefore you absorb it more or less, which is a problem. Obviously, if, it's, if everything you eat, it comes straight out the other end and you're actually passing three and four litres of fluid out your tail end. Yeah, there ain't going to be any drug left. But we have clever designer drugs that we use to treat inflammation in this bit. And the patients often come to us afterwards when we're treating colitis and say, doctor, the tablets are coming out unchanged. And they are, but not really. Because all they are is a very clever capsule and they have tiny micropores and they absorb all the stuff out of it and you get a ghost of the drug. So it looks like we passed the tablet unchanged. It's just if you analyse it, there's nothing left in it. So, <laughs> so it, it, it's actually quite a complex thing. But to malabsorb drugs is actually unusual. But there is no doubt that we can affect drug absorption with other drugs. And your gut has to be borne in mind if you're giving drugs that uh, require acid to be absorbed and you're on a proton pump inhibitor, one of the azoles, whatever, um, if you're on one of those and you need acid to activate it, and you've got no, very little acid left, you're not going to activate it. If it's deactivated by acids and you, you, if you have, say, pancreatitis, the enzymes that we normally produce from here, if you've got pancreatitis, you don't produce enough pancreatic enzyme. Pancreatic enzymes, you can give them by mouth, but they don't work except in an alkaline solution, which is where the bile comes in, which is alkaline, that neutralises the acid that your stomach's produced. So, clever, clever, if you give people pancreatic enzymes by mouth and don't reduce the amount of acid they get, you get no buck, buck bite for your buck at all, because it's gone into your stomach, the acid in there has deactivated it, and you go, ah, oh, wonder why that doesn't work, give them a bit more. But if actually give them the same dose with an acid suppressant drug, you might get activation of the drug and therefore it might work. Um, so, does that answer your question? And it, it is very difficult, but you can be reasonably reassured that the majority of drugs are actually absorbed high up here. The vast majority of drugs are absorbed high up there. And that is because they're small molecules and small molecules pass relatively easily. But I wouldn't ever say that it's always the case. Yeah. I'm particularly thinking about thyroid medication. Yeah. Natural desiccated thyroid medication. Yeah. And I know a lot of that's done in the liver. Yeah. So how does the liver fit into all of this? Right. Well, we I hope you all know that we have an inflow of blood, which is arterial, so you cut your artery, it hits the other side of the room. Very messy, bit of a bit of a shame. Cut a vein, it dribbles, all right? But the liver's the only organ that has two inflows. So what happens is you've got an artery coming in with blood straight out of the heart. You've got a vein coming out, which comes in the same way into the, what's called the inferior vena cava and goes back up to the heart. The catch is all this part of the portion of the bowel, all the way down to about there, and from about there, <laughs> right? It's provided by a, a, or it's drained, the blood, that, all the that stuff that's absorbed from here goes through what's called the portal vein. And the portal vein is a vein, so it's under low pressure, and that gets absorbed, all goes in, and then all this merges into one, and the portal vein goes into your liver. So that's where your stuff 
And your liver is really the first pass engine of the body. So all the food you absorb, you break down into small sugars, short chain fatty acids, short chain uh, amino acids, polypropotides, so those kind of things. Just so small, relatively small molecules. They go up into the liver through the portal vein. The portal vein delivers it to the liver cells because it's an inflow. The liver cells then do the engine building and then make other things out of it and then send them back out again through the hepatic vein into the other part of the circulation. I won't talk about the complexities of bad livers and that situation because it's quite complex. But if somebody wants to ask, they can. But I will try and make it simple. <laughs> Does that help? Yes. Does the liver therefore get unaffected by the flow of the essentially, yeah. essentially because small molecules get absorbed reasonably early in their travel because you have either an active transport system that actually just sucks things in and it's driven in, so sugars and things are actually sucked in and there are carrier molecules that pull them into the, into the gut and then into the portal vein thereafter. Small molecules such as drugs normally pass passively across in a osmotic way primarily they're not actively absorbed they just there's a low concentration in the cell a slightly higher concentration out and it goes inwards yeah was that vaguely sensible and yes. at a level that you understand and I don't, yes. I don't want to talk medical mumbo jumbo that you go oh, that's great <laughs> that's great a lady some concern good Next question. Can I share somebody yeah. else? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Thank you. So, IBS was the title. Um, does, does anyone suffer with IBS? Does anyone, has anyone been told that they have IBS? Good. I definitely, definitely have had and still do have IBS. There's plenty of hands going up in the room. Um, and the rest of you are lying. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it varies in terms of the, the numbers. I think um, about 15% of the population right now have active IBS, um, and about 40% will have it at some point in their life. And it can be really variable. It can be from just a few days to being completely life-changing and really very debilitating. And it is such a variable condition. Um, it, it's is slightly different in everyone. Um, when you come and see your doctor, there's lots and lots of questions we'll ask. Um, and every person that I speak to with IBS has a slightly different trigger, slightly different symptom. And so it's a spectrum. It really is broad. Uh, and it makes it quite hard to say, absolutely, this is IBS and nothing else without us doing a few important questions to start with. And perhaps some important tests in some cases where we're not absolutely certain. Um, and it's important to have those tests really right from the, from the offset. Um, and most patients that I see that I'm thinking, yes, this is a new case of IBS, I would be wanting to make absolutely sure there wasn't anything else that could potentially be causing it. And I think if I was to make a diagnosis of IBS for the first time in a patient without doing anything more than just taking a history and having a feel of your tummy, um, I probably wouldn't be, be doing it quite uh, the service that, that it should. Now, the advantage of being a GP is that I know you're going to come back to see me. And so sometimes um, I, I will say, well, I think this is probably IBS. This is what we could do. This, this is the sort of things you could try. But most of the time I'll be saying, giving you a, a form to go and get some blood tests and perhaps even a stool sample. Um, and we can talk about um, different types of tests that, that we'd want to do. Um, anyone that's got a new change in how their bowel is working, we need to be thinking about other causes than just labeling it as IBS. Um, and an incredibly common problem that, that I really underestimated right the way up until I became a GP was celiac disease. Um, it is incredibly common. Um, I know there's a, at least one person in here who's got celiac disease. Um, uh, but it, that's actually about right. You know, uh, odds are we probably would have someone in this room that, that has celiac disease. Um, uh, and we often 
have a significant delay in making that diagnosis because we're saying it's IBS or it's tummy cramps or it's something you've eaten or you picked up a bug. Um, and now, almost without fail, every single person that comes to see me with a change in bowels, I will definitely be screening for, for celiac disease. But it's not that easy either because the screening test is just a screening test. Um, and ultimately, if that level of suspicion is sufficient, I'd be writing a, a nice letter to, to Dr. Cox saying, would you mind seeing this person who I suspect has got celiac disease? Their blood test is positive. They have a very good history. They may even have a family history. Um, would you mind seeing them? Because there are other things that would, that would go on there from there. But, but IBS definitely is, from my point of view, the most common problem that I see patients with. Um, and it's not an easy one to treat. Um, for all those people that have put their hands up, I'm sure you've all tried something different, been told something different, and each time you go and see a different doctor, they might have said, do something completely different to the other doctor. And that's not particularly unusual, but, but nor is it, it unreasonable to, to get that response, given how broad a condition it is and how individual it can affect people. Um, I mean, just going around the, the, the room, anyone that has had IBS, um, were you just given lifestyle advice and told this could be stress or this could be the foods you're eating? Were you told to give a, 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 a diet or food diary to work out what it might be associated with? Were you, were you told, oh, go away and try some buscopan, you've seen the adverts on TV, it might be worth doing that? Um, were you told, go off to the health food shop, try some peppermint? That's, that's quite effective. I mean, all of those things are completely valid. Um, and you kind of, I, I feel like I'm fobbing patients off sometimes when I, when I say, this is, there's a lot about lifestyle here and we've got to think about foods and food diaries. But whilst you're doing that, maybe try some peppermint. And people look at me like, seriously, peppermint? <laughs> what? Um, but it, it, it's valid. Um, and we know that it can be really helpful for, for some people. I mean, why is it that we eat after eight mints? I mean, I love them, but um, you know, after eight mints are great. They're part of, they, they help with digestion. Um, lots of people naturally are drawn to peppermint tea as a digestive, um, and that, that helps. So we know that the peppermint oils are very effective, but um, there are lots of different approaches to, 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 te to treating this and to, to finding a solution that works with you. And I'll, I'll just hand over to, to Dr. Cox now to, to perhaps put his specialist view on, on what he sees as, as the, the tricks or the, the problems that we as doctors face and, and conveying that to you. Well, I think I mean, IBS is a, I mean, is, a, is a really difficult field, to be brutally honest. It's really, really difficult. And it gets more and more difficult as age goes on, essentially, because other diseases potentially get in the way. So essentially, in very simplistic terms, IBS is <coughs> gut-related symptoms that have no structural or inflammatory cause that we can find. And that might sound a bit fobby, and it probably is, because we probably don't really understand, is the answer, um, which is the biggest problem. Um, we believe that there are sensitivities and increased sensitivity in certain people's gut that make things go through faster or slower. There are tolerances that are different. They, people, if you put a balloon into people's colon and stretched it, some people would be able to take quite a lot of stretch and never get any symptoms. Other people would have the tiniest amount of stretch and get very significant pain. So there's a real spectrum across everybody. So it is actually really difficult. I mean, there's a condition that gastroenterologists talk about, which is called non-ulcer dyspepsia, which is an essentially irritable bowel syndrome of the top end. <laughs> um, it's you bit burpy, bit belchy, a bit indigestion. You don't have bad reflux disease, and you don't have a, anything very obvious in an ulcer form in terms of your stomach or duodenum. And that's irritable bowel of the top end. But the classical irritable bowel syndromes are the central or bloating, abdominal discomfort, crampy pains, fluctuating bowel habit, and diarrhea, diarrhea or constipation. And gastroenterologists are a mercenary bunch of um, what's it. And um, the experts in IBS um, have uh, tried really hard. And it's actually, I'll come to the point, it's actually quite important now to try and 
elucidate which group you are in. And these, are, uh, as Ollie says, the answer is it is not easy to put you into one category because everybody's slightly different. But we now classify people brilliantly as IBSC, which is IBS constipation predominant. Bloody brilliant suggestion that is to come up with a C. Um, I, a number of my colleagues spent at least a week in Rome coming up with that one. <laughs> Um, I thought they'd done very well, really. Um, and I'm going to shock you because there's something called IBSD. Yes, that's a diarrhea predominant <laughs> IBS. That took another month in Rome, that one. And, um, and then they couldn't decide because some people go between the two. So they came up with IBSM. Um, that took them months and months of deliberation in Rome and at least two seasons in the sun, uh, um, deciding that that was a reasonable description. But it's actually quite important now. And it's becoming more important because pharmacologically we are starting to make inroads not necessarily into the pathology of what's causing the problem but we are able to change the sensitivity and the fluid fluxes that go on in the gut quite significantly now with new drugs they are starting to appear but if you start treating somebody who's actually got IBSC with a drug for IBSD, even though the symptoms might be quite similar in some ways, is you're going to make them worse, not better. And that is obviously really important. And as we understand more and more of these drugs are coming on, on board and we are understanding more, and I would put my hand up, it is a very poorly understood disorder. Um, and there is no doubt there's an element of stress there's undoubtedly an element of food intolerance it is not allergy but it's intolerance i say it's not allergy because we can't measure any structural change that occurs in their gut whatever we do if and i have a family and i tell this to all my patients who if you give them tomatoes this is the family lovely family here you're going to have a tom cheese and tomato sandwich all three four of you no problems whatsoever i will leave you in here for a couple of hours i will come back a couple of hours later and three of the four of them will be on the floor rolled up with severe campy abdominal pain do i think it's the tomatoes yes i do believe it's the tomatoes i'm absolutely convinced it's the tomatoes can i prove it's the tomatoes by anything other than taking the tomatoes out of their diet and they get better no I can put tomatoes into their gut, I can measure this, that, the other. It makes not the slightest bit of difference. But it's tomatoes. And it doesn't have to be tomatoes, it can be all sorts of things. So it is really complex. So the intolerances are probably we don't understand enough rather than anything else. And another thing that I think is really important to understand is that the gut is an amazing immune system. If I gave you, minced up your dinner that you have either just had or are going to have when you go home, and push it into the solution and give it into your vein, you've probably got a 75% chance of being dead by the morning, which is pretty serious, really. And, you know, surprisingly enough, that's not a great option, is it, really? Um, but, you know, we eat and we have chili con carne, we have snails, we have a bit of fish, we have a bit of this, we have all sorts of exotica. We don't drop down dead. So the gut has an amazing ability to recognise this stuff as not ours, but not allow us to get an immune response to it. Where if you had it into your circulation, it would give you a really bad immune response. So you can imagine if that immune response is slightly abnormal or slightly less tolerant, you can get problems. Yeah? So that, I think, is really important. And the other thing I would say before going stopping is that we have more bacterial DNA in our body than human DNA. And of the bugs that we ha understand that exist in the colon primarily, but some in the small bowel, we probably have an understanding of about 50% of them. And what might be a great bug for you might be an awful bug for you. So our tolerance of the bacterial flora in our gut is another really important thing. So people say, Does it, is it related to antibiotic? Yeah, of course it is. Somebody change all your bugs in your gut with an antibiotic, some people will get problems.
mean, certainly, um, for, from a personal point of view, I, I never had IBS until I reheated a paella. <laughs> um, and, and I will never reheat a paella again. Uh, but I'll tell you the bug. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Uh, <laughs> pretty sure it could have been any of the rice, the fish, the chicken. It would be the rice. Yes, it would have been the rice. I know. I didn't know which way to point. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that had a massive impact on my flora, on what was living in my gut. Um, and I had hideous IBS for months after that. And then ever since then, uh, that happened at medical school for me. Um, then when I go and do exams at medical school, which are pretty stressful, I had hideous symptoms. I mean, just, I would be, in, I'd be in tears with pain before going into an exam. And people are like, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you stressed? It's like, no, I'm just in crippling pain with this IBS. And it was because I'd poisoned myself reheating a paella. Um, so it, it can happen from something as trivial as a food poisoning, right the way through to having antibiotics for a water infection or a cough. Um, uh, and that can have a massive impact. But equally, you know, deli belly or, or traveling has an impact on that. We all know that if we go to a different country and eat different foods and drink different water, that our tummies are often upset. Um, there's no measurable reason why that happens, but we know what's happening in our bowels is that, that the balance between the good and the, the bad, we've all seen the adverts of friendly bacteria and, and not, has changed. And, and our bowels respond to that differently. Uh, you know, some people have, oh, I've got a cast iron stomach, I can take anything. Um, and others barely have to, to, you know, change their brand of, of bread and all of a sudden that they're, they're crippled in pain. Uh, and I think that's a, an, an area of medicine that's incredibly exciting. And we talk about microbiomes and, and the, the interactions. We, you know, Dr. Cox has already mentioned, we, we know about 50% of the bacteria, but we have no idea how they interplay with each other. None whatsoever. Is A plus B better than B plus C? Or is that actually that a really bad combination? And is that a bad combination for you when, when you might have a different type of immune system or a different activity or different numbers of a certain type of receptor um, in your bowel? Uh, and equally, you might be unfortunate and have a food poisoning and then that just throws everything up in the air. Uh, <laughs> But it is incredibly complex, and I struggle every day with, with what you do with someone with IBS. And certainly from a GP point of view, I can understand why patients become so frustrated. I, I really put my backstop, and um, we've heard lots of back backstops in the news this week um, and last, um, but I put my backstop at making absolutely sure there's no physical reason why this is happening. Um, I might not be able to work out what the functional part of this is, and, and I try and see IBS as a functional problem. So if you take a snapshot of the bowel, it looks perfect. There is nothing wrong with it at all. But it's how it works. It's how it passes a bit of food onto the next part of the bowel and the next part of the bowel that is broken. And we can't teach it because, as we've already learned, as soon as we've swallowed it, we have no direct control over it whatsoever. Uh, and we can't reteach your bowel how to do something. And that's why it's really difficult. Um, and often we don't fob you off, but we try and use time as the, the kind of healing factor. And we try and coax you along and suggest things that might help and suggest things that you could do to try uh, to make things better. But, but sometimes they don't. And that's where you might get frustrated with your doctor. And believe, believe me when I say I'm just as frustrated with the condition that I can't help you any better to, to understand that. And that's why you'll get a different response from every doctor. Oh, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And it does become that trial and error. And you think, God, does anyone know what they're talking about? And, and we know that we actually don't really know a lot about it. So it's a bit of a mystery. Um, but a challenging one, and one that I quite enjoy trying to work out with a patient. But equally, I don't want them to get frustrated that we're not making progress when I don't really know which line to take. Um, but as we've said, there's new medicines coming on. We try and define it more as to are you constipated? Have you got diarrhea? Do you fluctuate between one and the other? Um, and that's really all that we can try and do is generally divide it. 
just going back to that, probably just, I mean, just, it's at, it sounds pretty crass to say we can't tell the difference between constipation and diarrhoea. You know, we're doctors, for God's sake, we should be able to know the difference between the two. But actually, people who are constipated often have spurious episodes of diarrhoea. Um, so it's actually, they are unable to pass the solid stuff down here and out for whatever reason. And as I said, there's lots and lots of fluid in here. And I always describe it as kids, babies with Play-Doh, all right? Babies with Play-Doh in water can move soft things and they don't make lots of bubbles if you put a bit of fairy liquid in there. You can challenge your children to move, move a, a snake of Play-Doh without making too many bubbles, all right? You ask them to do that with marbles and pass it from hand to hand, they haven't got a chance because they're squirting water all the time to move the, move the marble. The marble doesn't want to move, so they do it harder and harder to make the marble move. Lots of movement of water with a bit of fairy liquid, lots of bubbles. Same here, if you've got lots of solid stool down here, which shouldn't have any solid stool in it, probably. Lots of fluid coming in here. It's not very strong, this is really quite strong. This squeezes, doesn't move the solid stuff. What happens, the liquid goes flying past. And the solid stuff stays where it is. So you can be really, really constipated and have episodes of absolutely watery diarrhoea. So it's not us being completely stupid that we don't know which is which, but it, it, it's really important we, because often the diarrhoea is the thing that precipitates the consultation. Doctor, I've, you know, I've had an accident. You know, what a hideous thing to happen to anybody, you know. We thought we gave that up at about 16 months maybe two years you know I mean, you know it's not sort of the kind of thing that any of us like it's a horrible horrible event that will take you to see a doctor you know you're a 55 year old man or woman and you're walking through the middle of Solihull just walking into John Lewis and you go down that is horrible horribly demeaning awful situation you will go and see your doctor about that because that ain't normal but not having your bowels open for a couple of days. Oh, I'm probably all right. Didn't drink enough the other day. A bit of bellyache. Well, it's probably my fault. Never mind. I'll be all right. Not a major crisis until you're doubled up with severe pain. And the severe pain then is accompanied by an episode of spurious diarrhea. So you rush off to the doctor and say, oh, I've had a pain incontinent in the middle of John Lewis. I've had terrible pain as I walk through the door. Is it the diarrhea? No, it's not. So it's, it's just really important that we try and unpick it much more closely. Any questions about what we've talked about so far? No, I, I'm intrigued by the, the reheating of food. I know it's not quite off the subject. If you, had you heated it more, would that have bumped off, or is it not like that? No, so food poisonings can happen for lots of different reasons. Um, you can have a bacteria. You can have a bacteria that, that causes that. Um, so that has to be alive. Um, but bacteria have developed wonderful things called toxins and toxins are pretty hardy um, we get rid of quite a lot of bacteria by the hydrochloric acid in our stomach you know that gets rid of most things really I mean you, we all know how horrible that stuff is but toxins are pretty hardened to alkalis to acids and we'll get through and certainly with rice um, which was my culprit um, it produces some pretty hideous toxins. Um, the, if, if ever you want to go onto YouTube or, or look at how they make sort of the, the, the rice products that we reheat, they are treated to ridiculous levels to get rid of any bacteria. Absolutely. So the soft rices, the soft rices that are already sort of pre-boiled that you just reheat. Yep, yeah, exactly. They are treated so meticulously to get rid of all bacteria to remove any trace because it doesn't matter how high you heat it that toxin is okay, still yeah. going to get you <laughs> but that's the problem so yeah for me it was it was most likely a toxin but but there was probably you know a bit of campylobacter from the chicken and <laughs> a few other things in there as well yeah yeah exactly yeah, of um, course. These, 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 I've only just been given these actually. Mebeverine. Mebeverine. Yep. Why? Put the arms out. Mebeverine. Thank you. Mebeverine. 
Now, I said, I've only described these recently because I've been, like you said, at the count, taking copramol and all sorts of things. Yeah. Why do I have to take these 20 minutes before I eat? Because it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> That's because we hate our patients. <laughs> <laughs> there is absolutely... There, there, is, there is absolutely no reason to take them 20 minutes before food. Ah. It is baloney, um, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, the, the, there are drugs that undoubtedly you shouldn't take bef before or after food. There is no doubt, or with food and those kind of things. There is not, but there is no doubt something that you're taking three times a day that is absorbed very easily. It is actually going to be... Most of the function is actually through the circulation. It's not from what happens in the gut. It's not a designer drug. It's a drug that oh. actually... The peppermint works locally, yeah. but the, the mebeverine and the antispodomotics, like just buscopan and those kind of things, actually work through the circulation. So they've got to come down here, get absorbed up through the liver, and then back out again. So, so <laughs> oh, um, and they don't work really quickly. And if you measured the levels of that drug, if you took them religiously three times a day or four yeah. times a day or whatever you would like. Your levels will do this to start with, and then they gradually do that at a level. And it, and it doesn't oh, matter when you take it, you could take it at 10 o'clock one day and, and 11 o'clock the next day, oh. and not till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, then your level of your drug in the, in the circulation probably wouldn't have changed very much at it all. Could be indigestion initially. Because of, they might do. But will that calm down a bit? Should it do. seems a bit bad. I've been on them a week, so it does seem. Possibly, good. yeah. What do they do exactly? <laughs> You've asked a ridiculously difficult question because it, 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 uh, they're, they're, what they are meant to do is reduce smooth muscle spasm, which is to get rid of the colicky pains. Oh, okay. That's what they're meant to do. Um, like a relaxant. Well, relaxant, yeah, because what they're trying to do is this, the, the muscles of the, the bowel are smooth and they're not what are called striated muscles, like the ones you use to move your arms and legs and the like. Um, and they're smooth muscles, and their smooth muscle relaxants are there to try and stop that happening and, the, and getting a, a major gripping. So you're actually making it less powerful a contraction. Okay. That's the idea. Okay. The science behind all of these drugs is pretty ropey. So can I give you a little bit of injection? <laughs> um, yeah. If you probably went and put them into a randomised controlled trial these days as a new drug, they probably wouldn't get launched. Probably. But there are no doubt that some people it works. And that's the, that's the real catch. That some people it definitely, definitely works. Mm -hmm. But would you get enough data to support them to be, you know, first line, second line treatment? Probably not. Unless you turn around and say, well, there's nothing else in a certain number of people. That, would you see a, a very significant shift? You might do in a small percentage of people. Big enough to say, this is worth treating people is difficult. So that's IBS. Any other questions? Sorry, you were about to say. No, I, I, I mean, uh, all these tablets, uh, uh, is there a downside to taking them? I mean, presumably, they, in some cases, help with the symptoms, but is there a long term reason for not taking them? Does it gradually make things worse? Probably not, is the answer. I mean, it's, I mean there are a lot, the trouble with drugs is if you give enough of the drug out, you'll end up getting somebody having a significant yeah. side effect. And this is what's happened to the proton pump inhibitors. I mean, other than antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors have been worldwide the most prescribed drug in the world, which is fairly terrifying, considering only 30 years ago, a very small percentage of the population who turned up in hospital had ranitidine, which is the precursor, or cimetidine, um, as an acid suppressant. Now, if you were a junior doctor clerking in patients coming through the emergency at Solihull or Heartlands, probably 65% of people over 50 are taking them. Yeah, this is terrifying. I'd agree with that. All right. And on the fact that you're giving millions of people the drug, you're going to see a one in a million side effect significantly more frequently. But if you've only ever given people 500,000 people the drug, and it's a one in a million chance... You've got a 50-50 chance, you'll never see it. You know, so it, it's, a, it, it's a numbers game. Um, there are some drugs that are, there are predictable side effects because the consequence of doing what it's trying to do will have a negative effect. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of heart drugs, which by the way they work, actually make the gut work less well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of heart drugs make people constipated. Mm -hmm. That's, you know... 
The question is, do you want to live a long time with a bit of constipation or do you want to drop down have your heart attack? It's a fairly simple equation more often than not. Um, but, you know, there are, so there are things that are eminently predictable, but there are very idiosyncratic reactions to some drugs. And there are some that we know because of what compounds are active that you can predict there will be a problem. But, you know, it's a, my mantra would be as little drug for the shortest possible time, mm. yes. I think but that food doesn't. Thing, I, I think food affects, you know, I think certain things I eat, I, I'm sure, affect me more. And I'm learning. Mm -hmm. It's taken me a while, but I'm pretty sure it's some foods that just don't agree. I mean, the common, yeah, we, we go on to the next one really, I mean, yeah. is the food intolerances. Yeah. And I think, you know, we can, we can talk where the common ones are and, and, and things, but it is a game of trial and error a bit. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to move things on a little bit because I'm aware of the, the time. We've had a pretty interesting talk so far, but the next thing that I wanted to sort of touch on was the difference between food allergies and food intolerances. And we've already alluded to that, actually, a little bit with the tomatoes. Um, that's where intolerance fits in. Um, you know, you, you have a tomato, but you react to it, and there's nothing that we can measure that says there's something wrong other than the fact that it just doesn't work versus an allergy where you eat the tomato and suddenly your head becomes bright red and you start struggling with your swallow and your breathing becomes laboured and you start swelling up. That's most definitely an allergy and that's um, fairly easy to, to work out sometimes. You know, if, if you have an allergy to uh, food, most common these days are nuts. Um, and uh, it's interesting if you look at what's happened as a population. I remember being at school and no one had a food allergy. There was just, it just wasn't the case. Whether that was just ignorance uh, at the time, but now uh, at school or with summer camps that have started, if you're taking a packed lunch with your children, please do not include nuts because of that, that risk and that concern. And we're all very familiar now with the severity of some allergies and, and how lethal they can be in, in certain circumstances. There is no doubt that those are allergic reactions. Um, the tricky thing comes with intolerance, um, and that's where that sort of crossover between IBS and, and certain food types um, happens. Um, and then you come to conditions which certainly aren't intolerances, like um, celiac, which have very physical um, symptoms, have absolutely um, positive uh, blood tests and biopsy results and things that you can actually measure and prove there is a problem there. Sorry, yes, question. I found out the other day when I went to a gastroenterologist, and I've read that elsewhere now, that you can actually have celiac disease and not register positive on a blood test. That's right. Which is uh, interesting. That's yes. only recently. Well, that's why I, 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 I set that up originally and said that the blood test that we do is a screening test. It's not a definitive test. Um, the one that I would commonly request is something called a TTG. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's part of my standard screening panel, if you like. If I was seeing a patient um, that had got a change in bowel habits, I would always include a TTG to, to screen for that. But you're quite right. It's not an absolute. You can still have a negative TTG and be celiac. And that's where, when the level of suspicion is such, we ask someone like Dr. Cox to be involved because the next investigation is a little less pleasant than taking a blood sample. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and yeah. Yes. <laughs> so endoscopy is, is really what we are talking about there. Um, and the, the definitive test for, for celiac or the gold standard test, which again is still fallible, um, is a duodenal biopsy. So that's where we pop a camera down through the stomach into the duodenum, so that's the, the first part of the small intestines yes, on here. Um, so we go to the sort of second part, so I was talking about it being sort of like a letter C or G. So the first part is the, the top part of the C, the second part is the down part of the C, the third part is the bottom part of the C, and if you're talking about a G, then it's the kind of, the upstroke is the fourth part. Um, so yeah, you try and get into, into the duodenum and take a biopsy from, from there, and a biopsy is a sample of tissue. So we actually have to grab a bit of the lining and pull that out uh, and have a look. So it's, it's an ordeal. What's the success rate with actually finding a problem if it's there, if you're overtaking a microscopic sample? It is 
pretty good. There is, there is a small school of thought that celiac disease can be patchy, which is just what we really want to know. So you take a bit and it might be normal under one biopsy and not on the other. Most of the problem in reality is probably what's called sampling error, because what you're looking for is the villi, which are the finger-like things that expand the amount of surface area you have to absorb things. And the first thing to go is the tips of the villi, and then full-blown good going celiac disease, you've virtually got no villi. But it, if you've got full-blown celiac disease, really, you know, the classic, this is what the textbooks say, you'll have virtually no villi at all. Those are relatively easy to spot. But if you're taking a specimen and it's tangentially across a fold or whatever, and you snip off the tops of the villi, or you snip off the bottoms of the villi, and you've only got the tops. The processing will make it look abnormal. So there is a real question about: is it patchy or is it sampling error? There's probably a very small number of people who have true patchy celiac disease. The rest of it is probably technical related to the endoscopy, getting the biopsy right. The biopsy then has to be handled properly and actually put in a way that is actually lining down with everything up. And then when the histologist cuts it in their wax blocks, everything's in the right orientation. Because if you cut everything crossways, you get a very abnormal looking so appearance. you're talking about false positives? No, I'm, well, I, I, the, I'm talking that there are false negatives as well, because if you've got, if you cut halfway through a villa, you might look like you've got half of it and you think, and it, mm, I haven't got many big ones, but that one looks like it's heading the right. It's probably all right. There's not much inflammation. It's probably all right. You know, it's one of those. I mean, barn door celiac disease is relatively easy. Um, but what we call either latent celiac disease or early stage celiac disease, um, and some people don't get the complete flattening. They just lose the tips, and th that can be really quite difficult to... to um, diagnose and the best way of diagnosing it is not actually the structure of the villi it's the amount of inflammatory cells that you've got there that might promote destruction of the villi so if you've got a high count of these destructive cells in the in the tissue of there you're much more likely to have celiac disease than if you've got no inflammatory response and slightly odd looking villi you're, the inflammatory cells are the the actual the crux of it really I think the important thing to remember about medicine is we make a diagnosis not on the results of a test. Um, it's always about the balance of probability. Um, it, no one test will give you the answer, unless, of course, you're dead, um, in which case even that's sometimes in question. Um, but the, the point is, is that it's not just whether a test is positive or negative. It's about the whole picture. So it starts off with the history. It starts off with us having a level of suspicion and that we then scientifically want to prove or disprove. We create a null hypothesis. We want to know what's the chance of this. And of course, there is always going to be an error rate with that. Always. Um, I, I have to live with that every day when I make a diagnosis. And I hope that I'm sufficiently cautious but not overcautious, because, of course, if we over-investigate, if we do too many tests, that's quite harmful. You know, I think you have to really question how hard you're going to push doing these more invasive tests if actually you're pretty certain with the diagnosis already. If you know that this person's got a strong family history of celiac disease, um, whenever they have anything with gluten in, they have a significant reaction that lasts for several days afterwards, and they've had a positive TTG, then do they really, really have to go and have a potentially unpleasant test? Well, some would argue yes, some would argue no. Um, and that's really where the balance of probability comes. If you're wanting to constantly chase and, and find out more, yes, I find it much more comforting to make a diagnosis when I've got a positive test. Of course I do. It gives me something that I can stand back and say, for sure, that's what it is. But actually, a lot of what we do in medicine is about understanding what the person is going through and sometimes looking beyond the fact that they have a negative or positive test in one case or the other. That's a good time to bring it back to allergy and intolerance because I've been told that RAST tests, which is one of the tests you can get for allergy, 
Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, the doctor did the test and he said, well, some people get symptoms and are positive. positive. Some people get symptoms and aren't positive. And some people get no symptoms and are positive. And it's, they just basically did the test and discounted it. But however, it seems to me like that seems to be a precursor of how predisposition to developing problems because I, I had the test, it was positive, didn't have problems, later on developed problems. It's almost like it needs something else to trigger the actual symptoms as well. Well, I think there's a real complexity about diseases like celiac disease. Because if you read a, C, a textbook, even a 21st century textbook about gastroenterology, there will be a picture of a patient with celiac disease. That picture will be a 50-year-old lady with white hair who looks about 80. Who's a bit like that her bones are knackered. She's a bit thin and can't get off the toilet. All right? If that happens in 21st century medicine, somebody needs to be shot. <laughs> because that should not happen. People should not get to the point that they... Because this is gross malabsorption of very important vitamins and, and bone elements and nutritional things that actually make you go like that. All right? That doesn't happen in 24 hours. It happens over years. All right? I claim to see a lot of patients with celiac disease and be good at celiac disease. I biopsied for my MD thousands of people's duodenum not for looking for celiac disease. If anybody finds a black Afro-Caribbean patient with celiac disease before me, I will shoot them. All right? It's never been described in the black Afro-Caribbean population, but um, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> However, um, the... Uh, the issue is, even doing all those biopsies, you find lots of variation. And there's also the situation that um, <coughs> when you've got a little bit of inflammation, is it how much element do you put it? Could it be something else? Could it be drugs? Could it be they've had an infection? Could it be the And it's all about balance. I see the majority of my patients now who actually don't have a change in bowel habit. They have other symptoms. Because it's a systemic disease. They often, I get them sent from neurologists. I get them sent from uh, obstetricians. I get them sent from rheumatologists, from skin doctors, and all sorts of other places. It is not the classical diarrhea for wasting away issue. There are a few of them, obviously. And if you've got a change in bowel habit and you don't do the celiac antibody test, you're fairly silly because you're going to end up doing it sooner or later or should do. But the majority of the patients who actually have positive celiac celiology are not that group of patients, it's the others. And that's, that's the real catch. So it's much more complex than we ever wished. And unfortunately, it keeps us in business. But, uh, it, 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 you know, it's difficult because you just don't get it right all the time. Um. Food intolerances, I mean, it's really difficult to work out. You've had RAS tests, and, and that's certainly something that you may have asked for directly, having researched, or the GP may have suggested. Uh, often, it, as you've found yourself, it's, it's very hard to, to, even with a result, work out what the problem is. Um, I'm always, I walk past these health food places, and they say, come and get food te intolerance tests. And... I always look at that and go, what are they doing in there? What, what is it that they are testing for? What is it that they are, without sort of licking their finger and sticking it up to the wind, trying to establish is, is the problem? Um, and often with intolerances, it's simply a matter of you working out what it is that causes that problem. Um, and so it is keeping a food diary. It is being aware of what you eat um, to work out what it is. And going in and having a... A skin prick test is not going to tell you whether you have um, an allergy or an intolerance because, as we've already established, if we mince up our Sunday dinner and put it into our skin, we're probably going to be dead the next day because it's incredibly allergenic. It, it will cause a reaction because our gut is not in the way of it. And that's the problem is that if someone goes and sticks lots of different skin pricks of different food types on your skin, you'd be a 
you'd be unusual not to react to it. Now, it doesn't mean you've got an intolerance or an allergy. It absolutely doesn't. That just means that if you happen to inject that food type, you're going to have an allergic reaction. It doesn't mean that you have an intolerance. It doesn't mean that you have an allergy if it goes the right way, um, which is you swallowing it, not sticking it under your skin. Um, uh, and that's an important thing to, to remember. And I, you know, that, that might dispel a few myths, but certainly that's, from a medical standpoint, what I believe. And I'm happy to, to have other people argue otherwise, but there's no part of what we've talked about today that would make sense in that respect. And it makes sense from my point of view that if you stick something that shouldn't be under your skin, under your skin, you should have a reaction to it. And if you don't, you're very unusual. Um, so I'd be, be very wary of that. And equally, when you do go and have an allergy test, they're done with incredibly refined products. So if you go and see a dermatology for skin prick testing, they are really very refined, tiny, tiny amounts of whatever the specific allergen is thought to be. And that's really complicated. And I wouldn't hesitate to refer anyone that may actually have an allergy to go and have patch testing because that's a science in itself. It genuinely is. I love having a planted patient in the crowd. Um, it's really useful. No, it's, it's brilliant. I'm sorry. No, you're not. Absolutely. I, I think it's wonderful because you've actually brought some really important things and absolutely right that the reaction that you have can be delayed by days. It really can. And some of the reactions that I really loathe, and I'm, I'm really good at my diet, obviously, is um, my soft tissue reaction to things that are As I say, the answer is there is no, there is no, no there is no answer. right answer. There is no right answer. I mean, yeah. It would be, we would classify if we give you a meal with um, little bits of plastic in it, which we can see um, in, and we would look at transit. We can look at colonic transit, and if you've got more than ten percent of those plastic things visible on an X-ray at five days you've probably got impaired transit. If you've got 50% of them still there at five days, you've definitely got in transit. But the, one, the difficulty with all these tests that look at varying bits of the gut in terms of transit is how the hell do you get at them? And is it reasonable to measure transit and say that this is normal when I've stuck a tube down your throat put a pipe through the tube, deep into your small intestine, take the tube out again, and left it there, and then said, I'm now measuring what's going on. Is that normal? Because I don't know that it was behaving like that before I was invasive enough to stick a great big tube down your throat. You know, so it is really, really difficult. We can look at muscle contractions in the small intestine, and we can see some ideas, but the science is very, very new almost and we're getting better and better at it your 
comment about delayed reaction. I think these are immune responses. I think this is part of the irritable bowel syndrome. It's something to do with our gut immunity not working as it might be perceived as being normal, but we just can't unpick it and say what's actually happening to you. You know, because all those things that you describe of ulceration in things that turn over very quickly, like your mucous membranes, quickly is a very common feature of something that's actually toxic to you and an allergic response. In exactly the same way, delayed smooth, soft tissue swelling, joint pain is an immune response that's not instantaneous. It's gone through the circulation, gone to immune modulated cells in the lymph nodes, spleen and liver, and then comes out two, three days, you get a like ankle swelling, yeah? You know, it all sort of works. Can I prove that as yet? No, I can't, but it all makes sense. Can I ask what's your view of using activated charcoal to actually try and determine your own transit time? I mean, you eat stuff at the beginning, and then your food comes out black and the end, you've got that... It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a bad... It's not, not unreasonable. It's the same as the beetroot test. You know, you can do it with beetroot. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, um, you know. Um, so the, there are reasonable reasons. You can have a, make a, a reasonable stab, but the, again, the answer is what's abnormal. If you had some activated charcoal and you didn't see a dark black stool within ten days, you'd be going, oh, "What the hell's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> um, if you saw it at day four, maybe you'd be a bit worried, but. Day three, you probably wouldn't be worried. Day five, you might be a bit more worried. You know, it's, that's, you know the, the, our understanding of normality is the problem. So we've definitely had a nice long chat now. We've, we've just over an hour. Um, we we're going to talk a little bit about fad diets and exclusion diets. Um, exclusion diets to work out whether you have an intolerance are very valid and completely reasonable. Um, Fashionable diets, excluding celiac, um, the, the, or, sorry, excluding um, gluten, um, the, the wonder cures that that can have to people, um, uh, how vitalizing it can be, uh, I think certainly is social media hype in almost all cases. Um, and we're drawn to that. I think the one thing I would say about diets is that it does make us more interested in foods, and that's only a positive thing but I would always be very wary of an exclusion diet without having sought some form of medical advice beforehand because it can be very harmful uh, and it can be quite detrimental to your health in the long run to exclude specific food groups. Just from a nutritional point of view, you can be missing specific minerals, specific uh, vitamins, um, and you need to be very wary of that. Uh, you know, we fortunately have got over the, the, the notion that all vegetarians or vegans are going to have some form of vitamin deficiency. Um, <laughs> that certainly was the case 20 years ago when I was at medical school. Is there, you tell them all to have multivitamins. Um, now, um, I think anyone that is, it makes that conscientious decision to, to have a specific diet um, is so interested in that diet that they make really good decisions about what foodstuffs to have to make sure that it is as balanced and as varied as it can be. Um, and really that, I think, is the most important message I would give with regards to a diet is to make sure that it is varied, to make sure that it is balanced in terms of the different food groups that you are having, and to not go down radical one-food type diets, which can be really quite harmful to your health in the long term. Short term, you might see some benefits. Of course, we've all seen the exclusion diets for weight loss. Um, who hasn't tried one of those? Um, or the starvation diets and all those different types of things. But um, uh, that's fine in the short term, but long term it can have a significant detriment to, to your health. Um, and the last thing I, I really wanted to, to wrap up with was really the take home messages of what happens if. So when do we really start having our ears pricked up and, and thinking, gosh, I need to pay attention to this person. Uh, I really need to, to, to look harder, work, uh, more to, to find out whether there is anything to be concerned about. Um, the kind of buzz phrase are, are red flags. So if, if a red flag goes up, we all know what happens on the beach, we get out of the water. Um, and that's the same sort of thing that happens in, in any consultation. If a patient says that, that something has happened um, that we're aware is a red flag, then, then we really need to, to act on that. Um, it is now widespread throughout the country uh, that uh, anyone with a specific series of flags 
we would refer urgently um, under what is called a two-week wait um, to the NHS or privately um, to have it investigated as quickly as possible to establish whether there is something that we really should be concerned about or not. We've talked about the whole of the GI tract and actually those red flags are extensive across the whole of the GI tract and it would be impossible to shoehorn them all in to a, uh, a quick summary. Um, but I think I'll, I'll leave it to, to Dr. Cox to sort of sum up and, and tell us what in his mind are the things that as a GP and as a patient I would really want to know about as soon as possible and I would definitely want to act upon. Can we just go back to the picture again? Yeah, yeah of course. It's sort of fairly useful. Right, um, we start at the top and we'll do a whistle stop tour. Um, the good news is this bit. The small intestine is the biggest bit in the gut. Lots and lots of it. I think I've seen three small bowel cancers in my lifetime as a gastroenterologist. It's the biggest bit. It turns over most rapidly. It should have the highest risk of colon cancer. Of cancer. Full stop. It doesn't. All right. So the small bowel. There are no symptoms that will tell you you've got small bowel cancer. So we'll take that one straight out the window. All right. That is hen's teeth rare, and we find it by default rather than anything else. Anything down here? Yes. That's this. The esophagus. The bit, the tube that comes up from here. There, into your stomach. If food stops going down or starts getting more difficult to go down you need a scope. There is no doubt, all right? Because you can't tell what's there until you've had a look, all right? That's called dysphagia. Dysphagia is quite uncommon, and if Ollie and his primary care colleagues have somebody with dysphagia, they send the patient directly for an endoscopy. Sorry, it's not pleasant, but the answer is, what they're asking is, does this patient have esophageal cancer, yes or no? That's the only question that's being asked, all right? essentially, but that definitely needs to be dealt with. As far as the stomach is concerned, I'll just take one thing. If you've got dysphagia that becomes painful, so when you swallow it really, really hurts, I'd give Ollie a nudge and say that's even more important than a young person who's age-wise is low risk of having esophageal cancer, but still could. But you've got low risk, but they've got painful dysphagia, I'd say that's even more of a red flag. Cancer in the stomach is a complete nuisance. In Japan, they have a totally different disease. And early gastric cancer is something that they go hunting for all the time. We see it incredibly rarely. That's probably because we're blind and useless endoscopists. That's the current mantra from the BSG, which is started gastroenterology, but I don't actually believe all of that. The issue is that the diseases are different in, in the different races. However, people who have stomach cancer, the things that worry you, you tend to be older, so it's very unusual without a very strong family history to get cancer in the stomach under the age of 55. Very, very unusual is feeling full really quickly. So you've gone from, oh, I go out and have three, three or four pints and I can have a nice curry and, uh, and then on the way home I'll have a bag of chips, yeah? To, um, well, I ate about as much as my 18-month-old grandchild the other day and I felt completely full and sick and those kind of things. So it, that's just threatening that your stomach is not expanding and you've got a rigid stomach and you feel full early. The other thing is if you become anemic, so tired, because you're bleeding without anything knowing. So an anemia per se is something that's really important. It's very easy. If you vomit blood, it's come from the top end. It comes out bright red out the tail end. Jesus, it's going to be from the bottom end. There we are, because if it's coming out bright red and it's from up here, you're in real trouble because it's got, it means there's lots and lots and lots of it and you're in real, real urgency. But you know, anemia without any obvious blood loss is likely to be from here. All right? Pancreas is a nightmare. Pancreatic cancer is a disaster. It sits right at the back of the body. It can get really big without causing you any symptoms, especially if it's here, because that bit is involved with producing your insulin and things. This bit produces all the digestive disease. But the reason that this this map is very unfair because it's not quite true because it wraps all the way around this bit. And the reason that you get early presentation of pancreatic cancer is when it blocks this duct here. All right? More often than not, uh, if you're going to get an early pancreatic cancer, it's caused you to go yellow because your bile duct doesn't drain anymore. Unfortunately, the majority of them that present 
are late and even there, there's a great big mass that's finally blocked off the bile duct. All right, so pancreatic cancer is very difficult to diagnose, a complete nuisance and bad news, but it's characterised by weight loss and back pain. Prognostically terrible, awful disease. Primary liver cancer, hen's teeth rare unless you've got cirrhotic liver disease or you're Chinese. Um, so you've got to have a reason to have a bad liver. So you've got cirrhosis, be it from alcohol, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, rare autoimmune metabolic reasons that give you cirrhosis of the liver. If you've got non, if you've got a normal liver, to get a primary cancer in your liver is hen's teeth rare. Most of the cancers that people see in the liver are secondary cancers because there's anything that comes from here goes through the filter system in there and it all gets trapped in the liver so it's one of the commonest places to get secondary spread. All right, so primary cancer there. We miss out the small intestine because there's, it's so rare. Colon cancer. Well, if you bleed from here, you have bright red blood coming out of your bottom. All right, if you've got bright red blood coming out of your bottom when you're 20 and you're going to the toilet once every four days and you're a bit constipated, it's probably hemorrhoids. If you're 75 and you've never had any blood coming out of your bottom before and all of a sudden you're going to the toilet three times a day when you used to go once a day and there's bright red blood coming out of your bottom, you've got rectal cancer until proved otherwise. So it's that spectrum, all right? So the younger you are, the less likely it is to have a problem. But if you've got somebody who's potentially at risk of having colon cancer, and that means almost anybody over the age of 50 or people younger who've got a very strong family history of colon cancer who've got rectal bleeding, you need to have a look in. If they've got bright red rectal bleeding, you only need to look up to here because it's not coming from anywhere else. All right? It's probably coming from here. The huge majority will be coming from the anal canal. That's where blood comes from. It's all hemorrhoids, fissures, splits, those kind of things. But you might have a polyp, you might have a tumour. These tumours anywhere else. This one characteristically, and Holly will remember as a medical student, nasty, unpleasant doctors, gastroenterologists would say, if you hadn't investigated somebody with iron deficiency anemia with no symptoms for sequel cancer, you are a buffoon. All right? Uh, you can bleed from here very slowly, trickle, trickle, trickle. It gets absorbed, all the water gets absorbed, the blood doesn't really go black because it's the digestion of red blood that makes it go black little bit absorbed into the gut, into the bowel, it comes out. Iron deficiency anemia, anybody over 50, any male over 55 or a postmenopausal woman is colon cancer till proved otherwise. That doesn't mean it is, but if you don't look for it, you're going to miss it all the time. And the other ones are people who've had a change in bowel habits. So there's a structural anomaly somewhere along. So it's gone narrow, right? So if it's gone narrow, things don't go through so well. So you either suddenly start passing very thin stools, you're going more often, you get plain. Unfortunately, we still see people who present with complete obstruction, so they just stop. This lot will blows up like a balloon and they come in as an emergency. All of you who are over 60, who have had a stool sample sent to you on their birth, 60th birthday by the NHS and haven't sent it in, are stupid and foolish, and I would be very rude to you. Thank you. Because that is a test. It's not a test for cancer, but it tells you if there's blood in your stool. If you've got blood in your stool twice without it being obvious, the answer is you need somebody to have a look to make sure you don't have cancer. The chances are you don't have cancer. But bowel cancer is a pathology that starts off as a little lump. It then becomes a stalked lump and looks like a bit of a cauliflower florette, it then becomes a big cauliflower florette with an ulcer in the top of it, it then becomes full-blown cancer. If you've got even a cauliflower florette with an ulcer on the top with no invasion into the stool, it is curable by endoscopic measures without surgery. All right? So the whole idea is you're trying to get people before they get complete blockage, about which you have to chop a bit out, and obviously if it's advanced, it may well be up here by the time you've actually got the diagnosis. Yeah, and men are very good at it. The ostrich position. It will be better tomorrow. So a whistle stop tour.
It is. I hope everyone's enjoyed tonight. Um, there's plenty of time for more questions afterwards if you still have any, but I think um, as far as a uh, introduction to bowel problems, um, focusing on any topics that you're interested in, I hope you found it useful, but um, we've, we've certainly extended a little bit because of, of, of the interest. But thank you very much for coming to, to Daleswood Health and thank you very much to Dr. Mark Cox from uh, Spire Parkway for, for attending this evening and helping answer some really interesting questions from, from the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.